Anyways, I'm excited to be here with you guys today. We're going to finish up our series, Our Amazing God. And uh, the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to you about the importance of pre-deciding, making a decision on how you're going to respond to something that comes into your life. And today, I want to talk to you, those of you who feel like giving up today, those of you who are just have hit a wall or you're just in this position in your life where you're just like, man, God, I just, don't, I, di- I just feel like giving up. I don't want to go forward anymore. And maybe you had a goal or a dream or a vision and you started it. But then you, you hit this wall. You hit this wall of resistance and it stalled out. And there's little or no progress and you're discouraged now. You're discouraged and you feel like just giving up. You're just, you're just tired. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe some of you this morning have a relationship that you've tried to restore. You've you've reached out endless times to restore it. But it just seems like every time that you reach out, it gets worse. Or maybe you're fighting for your marriage this morning. Maybe you're in a difficult time in your marriage and you're trying to figure out, God, how am I going to get through this? And really, you're fighting for your marriage, but you're running out of fight. You're running out of the will to continue in this endeavor. Maybe you're believing for a miracle this morning. Maybe you have a child that needs healing. Maybe you're in a financial situation that you just really need God's breakthrough. Maybe you're suffering with an addiction this morning. And you've tried. You've done everything that you can. You've tried. You've prayed. You've believed in God. You've believed that God is greater. That that. That God, all things are possible through God, but it's just not working and you're discouraged and you're losing hope. Well, today I want to talk to you, and the title of this message is When God Won't Let You Quit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're a God that will not let us quit, but Lord, there's some things that we have to do in our lives, steps that we have to take, God. So today as we close out this series on our amazing God. Father, thank you that you're going to speak to us about a very, very difficult thing for all of us in this room. So Holy Spirit, we ask for your blessing and your power today to give us eyes and ears uh, that'll be open, that'll be tentative, that are willing to take in and receive what you have for us. And we ask this humbly in Jesus' name and all the church said. As I said, we've been talking about pre-deciding things, right? Decisions. Over the last couple of weeks, I've told you that the direction of your life is determined by the quality of your decisions. The problem isn't the problem. The problem is the decisions that you make leading into the problem during the problem. And so I've told you, when you're faced with this situation then you have to pre-decide, this is how I'm going to respond to that situation. And today I want to talk to you about finishing. Finishing. Things are easy to start, but they're hard to finish. And this is an idea that you've got to get inside your head and your mind. It's important for you to understand this this morning. Finishing is hard to do. It's easy to start things. Let me ask you a question. What do you think separates Average people from amazing, fulfilled from empty, successful from those who struggle. Well, let me tell you, it's not intelligence. It's not. It's not their appearance. It's not their talent. It's not their education. And it's not who they know or what they know. I'll tell you the key to being able to be successful and lead an amazing life. It's a word we don't like to look at in the Bible, and it's called perseverance. Perseverance, the drive to finish, the refusal to quit. That's what perseverance is. There's a lady by the name of Angela Duckworth. I'd never heard of her before. And then putting this message together and stuff and and Googling and cheating like I always do, um, I found out about this lady, and she's actually a groundbreaking researcher when it comes to children and teaching children how to do just this, persevere. And she said, why do successful people succeed? Teachers, military people, 
business people, spelling bee champions. Why are they successful? How come they succeed? And she said it's one word, and that word is grit. Grit. Strength of character that refuses to quit. That's the difference. If you're taking notes, write this one down. Enthusiasm is common. Endurance is rare. Enthusiasm is common. Endurance is rare. Oh, we're enthusiastic when something new is coming out. Like every time we start something new in the church, people come out by, by, by the droves. But after a while, uh, it's not exciting anymore. And, you know, and it starts to wane out. Why? Because endurance is rare. People don't know how to endure today, man. This is a society of quit or cancel. But this is what I want us to get into our hearts and minds this morning. We need to pre-decide we are finishers. Say that with me. We are finishers. Say it again. We are finishers. That's what's going to make the difference. When I commit, I don't quit, I'm a finisher. That has got to be in your heart and mind. When I commit, I don't quit, I'm a finisher. That's the key. That is the key. Right? Because listen, we need to learn how to strengthen our perseverance. We need to have, have the ability to get to that point where we have that grit, that refusal to quit in our spirit, in our mind. Look at Paul's emotional farewell to his spiritual son Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, in context, Paul has appeared before. Uh, the Roman Emperor Nero. Remember, he had, he had uh, said that he wanted to go before Caesar. So he goes before Nero, and Nero sentences Paul to death. Now, Paul is awaiting execution. But now, it's not in the, he's not in the same prison that he was in before. The prison that he was in the first time, he was chained to somebody. It was kind of like kind of house arrest type of thing. But here, he's in the place where people who are going to be executed go. And it's nasty. It's basically a sewage drain. And they stick him in there. And a lot of the prisoners died before they were executed because it was so unsanitary and so nasty there. And a few days before Paul's death, he writes to Timothy, his spiritual son, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, something profound that we need to get inside of our hearts and our minds this morning. In verse 5 it says, Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news. And fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. Paul tells Timothy, you must do what I have done. You must fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. Some of you are quitters. God gives you a ministry and you quit. For whatever reason, you quit. And I get it. Life comes. Life gets in the way. But some of you have quit when it wasn't the Lord telling you to quit. You stepped out because you got tired and you got weary and you were relying on your own resources. Paul says, I have fought the good fight of faith, or uh, fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Paul finished. Paul had finished. How do you know Paul had finished? Because he was going to die in a few days. Unless God miraculously was going to deliver him from this execution, Paul was going to die. So his race was obviously finished. Right? But God isn't finished with you. If you're discouraged and you're ready to give up, listen, you're not dead, so you're not done. Right? You're not dead, so you're not done. Church, there's more to do. There's way more to do, church. More love to give. More people to help, man. Ministries to start. Businesses to launch. Content to create. Hope to share. Friendships to make. Addictions to break, man. God's got more for you. But you got to get to the next level. And here's what happens in life. I know, because I'm experiencing this, and this message, if you don't get anything out of it, I did, because it was speaking directly to me. I get into this, I have so much to do syndrome, right? 
This building is taking its toll on me right now. It really is. I'm being honest with you guys. And I am overwhelmed, right? I'm overwhelmed with it. But then I read this little tidbit from this dude named David Allen who's got a book called Getting Things Done. This guy has like a systematic program where he teaches people how to do time management. It's actually pretty cool. Here's what he says. Much of the stress that people feel doesn't come from having too much to do. What? No. It comes from not finishing what you've started. That's where the stress comes from. It's not finishing what you've started, right? Think about it for a moment. What have you not finished that you started, right? What are the things that God has prompted you to finish that you have not finished? Now, I'm not talking about season four on Netflix or anything like that. I'm talking about what has God given you that you were supposed to see through and you haven't done it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 says this, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of of my God. God knows your deeds. God knows the things that you're doing in your life. God knows the things that he's called you to do. And listen, those things are unfinished in the sight of God. So what's your unfinished business this morning, church? What is it? Is it healing a broken relationship? I always hear, oh, there's no, there's no restoring that relationship. You know what? Maybe you just got to dig a little harder. Maybe God's been telling you to share your faith with somebody, but you're scared. You're afraid to do it. No. Share your faith. Maybe God's told you to give, and you're not giving. Maybe you need to finish your degree. Or start a hobby or join a recovery group, right? Serve, start a ministry, launch a business, drop 20 pounds. I could, right? I could drop 50. Apologize. Some of you don't know how to apologize to anybody, man. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10, he says, Here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now, finish what you started. Finish what you started. The Corinthians were on fire to help out the other churches, but it looks like here that they may have started to tail off a little bit, and Paul says, no, you need to finish what you started, man. Now, you may ask, why does it matter if I quit, Pastor? Why does it matter? So what? So I don't see it through. Big deal. Let me tell you something. Every four years, we go to the, to the polling booth to vote for a president, a vice president, or whatever it is. And every time you go in there, you cast a vote for the future. Right? When you cast that vote, they haven't won yet, or they haven't lost. But you're casting a vote for the future. Well, let me tell you something. Every decision you make in your life is a vote towards your future, good or bad. Every decision that you make is a vote towards your future being good or bad. So when you decide to quit, you're voting that you don't have what it takes. That's what you're voting. That's what you're voting. I don't have what it takes, right? But when you stand strong, when you persevere, when you don't back down, you're voting, I'm a finisher. I persevere. When I commit, I don't quit. I remember when I was coaching football, and I was at this school, a small school called Esparto, right? I'd never even heard of this school. I didn't know they even had a high school. We had just finished up coaching for years at Vaca Christian, and so we had taken a year off, and the Sparta had reached out to us. And they had not won a game in five years. They were, they were 0 in, in 50, right? They had not won a game in five years. And so we came in, brought our system in, and the first year we went 9-1, and one and we went to the semifinals of the regionals. We just co- totally changed the culture. But there was one young man that I want to talk about this morning. 
and I won't say his name because I don't have permission to say it, but he was a sophomore. And he was a stud, little guy, but he could ball. And he had been a defensive lineman the whole time that he had played football since he was a little kid. But I saw this kid's footwork, man. And I saw the way he saw the field. I'm like, man, this dude's a linebacker. If I've ever seen a linebacker, this kid's it. So when we came into to, to training camp, I took him and I put him as an outside linebacker. And he was like a fish out of water. He didn't know anything about playing linebacker. I said, dude, I got you. I'm going I'm to get you through this. And he struggled, man. He would over-pursue. He would do dumb things. He wouldn't close down. He wouldn't, he wouldn't take the end away. He just did these crazy things all the time. And I'd be sitting there with him going, man, don't worry about it. You're going to get 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 it. And finally, man, we, did, we had a scrimmage against Dixon High School, and he bombed. I mean, he just got burnt every, every single play. He just looked. And he comes to me and says, Coach, man, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. So what do you mean you're done? He said, I'm done, man. I don't want to play outside linebacker no more. Put me back on the line. I said, dude, you're not a lineman. First off, you're like, this, you're like five foot one, right? And I said, you're an outside linebacker if I've ever seen one. No, nah, I can't do it anymore. And I just looked at him and I said this. I said, today is the day you're going to decide what kind of a person you are. He said, what? I said, today's the day when you're going to decide what kind of a person you are, man. Are, are, are you the type that's going to quit every time you face adversity, right? Or do you have the mentality to be an overcomer? I said, man, just take your gear off and go. And I said, I'll see you next practice, and you tell me what you want to do. So he came to me, and he's like, man, coach, he says, man, I want to be an overcomer, man. I want to be that person that can... That can that looks at adversity and can move forward. I said, fine, then this is what we need to do. And this dude took off. He rocketed. First team all league. First team all NorCal. Sophomore. Stud. This dude rocked it. We went to the awards ceremony for him, right, for, for the team and everything. And, and after that, he comes over to me and he says, Coach, man, Thank you, thank you for not quitting on me. I said, no, thank you that you didn't quit on yourself, bro. He says, man, he goes, the awards don't mean nothing, coach. You taught me not to quit. You taught me not to quit. Listen, man, you all may see me struggle, and you've seen me struggle, right? I don't, I don't pretend to be anything in front of you guys, ever. You've seen me struggle, but you will not see me quit. When I commit, I don't quit. I'm a finisher. I'm a finisher. Acts 20, 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, not only aim to finish the race. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul said here, he says his only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord had given him. Every one of you have a different task that God has given you to complete. He's given it to you. But there's a phrase that many people miss here on why Paul finished the race. Now let me tell you something. Paul had a lot of setbacks. Did he not? He had a lot of obstacles. People drug him out of the city and threw rocks at him and, and, and tried to kill him. In fact, I think he did die, and then he came back. He was shipwrecked, beaten countless times, in prison. If anybody had obstacles, it was Paul. Persecution and pain was part of the ministry for him. But let me tell you what most people miss, and here's the key. What did Paul say? He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. When you are running for God, you aren't concerned with what's going on around you, man. You're not concerned with people. You're not concerned what they're saying about you. You're not concerned with anything. It's about God and his will for your life, and you push through. See, the problem is a lot of us have the I syndrome. It's all about me. 
It's all about what I'm doing. I, 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 I. And so, yeah, you're going to feel like quitting because it's all about you. So when you're tired and you're weary and you're worn out and you're emotionally thrown out and everything else, you're going to want to quit. But when you don't care about your life and only care about God, then you will keep going. You will keep going. If you're quitting what God had you start, then you consider something more valuable than running God's race. Yeah, that hurts, doesn't it? That was painful for me to look at because, yeah, I've experienced quitting. But Paul said, I consider my life worth nothing. But that's not us in the modern church today. You know, I consider my personal comfort or I consider my net worth, or I consider people's opinions, or I consider my own personal hopes and dreams, right? That's what we consider. But God says, no, that's not it. It's me and me alone. Your life is worth nothing unless I'm at the helm. And this is why we all experience failure so much, because we don't have God at the helm of our lives We don't have God at the helm of our lives. And so because of that, we fail. Because of that, we quit. So how do you finish the race God called you to run? Let me tell you how you do it. One step at a time. When you run a race, you have to put one foot in front of the other to keep yourself moving. And it's the same thing. If you want to finish the race God has called you to, you take the next step, take the next step, take the next step, take the next step. You don't have to finish it today. But you got to take the next step. And some of us can't take the next step. We do this, and we're frozen. Fear. Fear is a huge factor in keeping people from, from taking the next step. But listen. Our Lord and Savior, who is our example for everything, is an example of somebody who just kept taking the next step. Jesus knew where he was going. Jesus knew he was going to the cross. It wasn't like he was surprised. Whoop, they're arresting me. I guess there's something going to happen. No, Jesus knew he was going to the cross, and it never stopped him. He said, I'm going to keep going. Because this is my destiny, no matter what it costs me, no matter how much pain I'm in, this is my destiny. Some of you are afraid of pain and suffering. Nobody likes it. I get it. But if you are going to call yourself a Christ believer, you better get used to it. You have to get used to it. Remember, when Jesus was on the cross, he's hanging there in all of his shame. And he says, it is finished. Like Paul, Jesus had finished the race. And think about all the emotion that was involved in Jesus' life up to that point. And at that point when he was on the cross, all of the sin and hate and nastiness of the world was pointed directly at the master's body as he hung on the cross. They hated Jesus, but what did he do? He loved them back. Jesus is on the cross, and he had love for those who were, who were crucifying him. When he was before the chief priests, they struck him. You struck the God of the universe on the face, and he turned his cheek. He could have just looked at him, and they could have been incinerated. He didn't do that. He's carrying the cross, and he falls down, weary, broken, beaten, had not slept for for hours, 24, 27 hours. But yet, he gets up. He stands back up with the help of another man and carries his cross. They cursed him on the cross. Cursed him. But he forgave them. He forgave them, church. Why? 
because Jesus knew how to persevere. And Jesus knew it was never, ever, ever about him. It was about us and saving us from sin and the wrath of God that was going to come to this earth someday. Church, this morning, you have to pre-decide. When you commit, you don't quit. I tell people all the time, don't, don't tell me you're coming to church. Please, don't tell me you're coming to church. Right? D- just don't tell me. Because when you show up, I go, I know what your word's worth. And when people come and visit the church, don't tell me you're coming back. If you don't come back, you don't come back. No big deal. But don't tell me you're coming back. So it tells me your word's not worth anything. When you commit, you don't quit. You got to stay committed. Maybe, maybe you're praying for somebody and you're just ready to give up. Say another prayer, man. Push through. Maybe you're trying to restore a relationship and you keep calling and nothing happens. Make another call. Don't give up. Maybe you're supposed to give another gift, send another email, run another mile, memorize a verse, take another lesson, ask for another meeting, talk to your child, pray for your child, forgive again, dream that dream, but whatever it is, when you commit, don't quit. You cannot quit. You have to take another step. Okay, that's great. Sure, pastor, take another step. But what if I feel like I can't do it? What if I'm so weary? What if I'm so tired? What if I'm so broken? What do I do? I'm going to bring you back to the 1992 Barcelona Games at the Olympics. There was a cat by the name of Derek Redman. He was from Britain. And he was a gold, gold medalist contender in the 400 meters. And they take off. He's running. He's running the race, running the race, running the race, neck and neck, neck and neck, neck and neck. And all of a sudden, boom, he blows out his hamstring, falls to the ground, bam, hits the ground, man, withering in pain, man. And his dad comes out of the stands and walks over to his son and pulls his son up off the ground takes his son's arm and puts it around his shoulder and walks him across the finish line. See, you have a father that wants to do that for you. You have a father who wants to pick you up and take you across the finish line. But you're making this whole thing so much about yourself that God says, fine, do it on your own. And when you're laying in the dirt and the blood and the mud and everything else and crying and whining about this and whining about that, God's saying, I'll pick you up. I'm right here. I've never left you. I will never leave you or forsake you. And the Lord will pick you up and he will keep you from quitting. Why? Because Philippians 1.6 tells us that being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Carry it. It's Jesus' work. You are Jesus' work, but you and I don't act like we're Jesus' work. We act like we're, we're, his, we're our own work. And God's saying, no, you're not. This is why you fail all the time. This is why you don't succeed. It's because you, 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 you keep trying to do it. And God's saying, no, I will carry this work because I began the work in you to begin with. It was his work. Come on now, I'm preaching hard on you praising. Let's go. You guys are sitting there like you're, come on, are you getting this? People quit everything. We never let our kids quit a sport, ever. You finished out the season, I don't care. Stop that whining and snibbling. Why? Because you needed to learn how to finish. Some of you don't know how to finish anything. You start, oh, you start. You don't know how to finish. You don't know how to finish. And then when you finish, it's a terrible finish. It's terrible. People are quitters. Why? Why do people quit? 
I'm going to tell you why. Because quitting is an option. It's an option. Quitting is an option. Right? People get married and they quit. People start a job and they quit. People get into a ministry and they quit. People start, start towards a goal and they quit. Why? Because quitting is an option. But what if quitting wasn't an option for us as Christ believers? What if that wasn't an option? What if that wasn't an option? Would that change our perception? Would that change how we attack things? Because I think it would. Because I'm going to tell you, I wanted to quit this week. I wanted to just quit, quit, quit. I'm like, Lord, I'm done with this, man. I'm done with the city. They're driving me crazy. They're costing us more money, money that we don't have. Where are the sheep going to be? You know what, God, they're your sheep. You put them somewhere else. I don't want to deal with it no more. I'm going to take my wife and leave this state. I can't stand it. That's how I felt. And the Lord says, no, you can't. You cannot quit, and you cannot go anywhere. Because if you do, it'll be all bad. Now, I'm not saying that God's going to do something like really bad to me. But I'm just saying that his best won't be there. Church, we've got to learn how to finish and finish the right way. When I commit, I don't quit. I'm a finisher. And that's what God kept pounding in my head this week. Finish. Finish finish. Some of you need to finish. Some of you, some of you think that you have time to finish. You coast. People that coast drive me crazy. I I can't coast. You know why I can't coast? Because my days are so unpredictable that if I put something off or I think I'm in the driver's seat or if I think I'm good to go, it never turns out that way because something always happens. My truck broke down. I spent a one-hour fix. It was a six-hour fix for your pastor. Why? Because he's dumb and doesn't know anything about electricity. And I had to do an electrical thing in my truck, and it was, just, it was a nightmare. I must have watched 20 YouTube videos to just learn how to take the panel off, the, the door panel off, because nobody told me there was a screw in the middle that nobody can see that holds the door panel on. Take out these three screws is what everybody told me, and I could not, I, I mean, I almost broke the door panel trying to get it off. I said, there's got to be another YouTube video out that can tell me what's going on. And I pull up and the guy goes, oh, yeah, by the way, there's a little known, there's this little black pad right here that you got to take a little special hook and pull back, and there's your screw, and you can take it off, and just, boop, it came right off. Two hours I spent on that. Church, along with finishing, is stop procrastinating. Because when you procrastinate, I can tell you you're not going to finish. And if you think you're ahead of the game, you're not ahead of the game because something's going to come in, especially when you're dealing with Satan, and he's going to throw a curve at you, and the next thing you know, you're going to be up on a deadline, and you're going to be like, whoa, what am I going to do? Get it done, then it's over with, you don't have to worry about it, and then you can coast, right? I'd rather get my work done than then chill, then get my work started, chill a little bit, and then be in stress mode trying to get it done. Church, we can't do that. God wants to complete the work in you, just like he wants to complete it in me. And he will carry us. And here's what you need to put in your your mind and heart right now. God will will, will not let you quit if you commit to him. 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 And when you do, I'm telling you, you will find hours in the day that you did not know you had. Because now you're not trying to get things done on your own strength. You're getting things done in the strength of the Lord. And I don't know how he does it, but he will magically, I don't know if I can say that word in the church magically, but anyways, he magically will find me more hours in the day so I can get stuff done when I'm committed to him. Church, we are finishers. Say that. We are finishers. We are finishers. Now, prove it. Prove that you're a finisher. Finish what you've started. I don't care what it is. Finish your marriage. Finish it until death do us part. I'm committed to my wife no matter what. I know this week she's probably thinking a few times, Lord, take him. You know, get him out of here. He's, he's unbearable, right? I'm on, he's just unbearable. My gosh, you know. But I'm committed to her no matter what. I don't care. 
And I know she's committed to me. Because we're going to walk this thing out together. Why? Because we're not going to quit. Maybe you're in a job that you don't like. Don't quit. Maybe God has something for you that if you push through, if you could push through it, he's got a blessing waiting for you that you never knew was going to come. Maybe there's a relationship that has just stalled out. You can't stand each other, whatever it is. Trust God. I'm telling you, if you change your heart, God has a a marvelous way of changing other people's hearts. But see, we always want the other person to change first. Or we think that we've changed, but then I can tell you, I can tell when people haven't changed because then they still talk about it and they're still mad about it. Well, you ain't changed. So why do you think God's going to change them? Change yourself first. Don't quit, church. Don't quit. Because when you commit to God, he will not let you quit. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we thank you for this reminder that we're called to finish the race. And, Lord, it's a struggle, man. I, I get it. And I know it's not easy for us especially being your kids. God, you never promised anything but glory for us when we leave this earth. And so the war, the, the, the war is on, Lord. The, the road is rough, and there's a lot that's coming at your kids, Lord. But it's in those times, God, that we need to seek shelter in you. You are our refuge. You are our strength. And, Lord, what does it say about you? If your kids quit every time there's a struggle or or something that's a hardship, Lord. Father, I just pray you would bless my brothers and sisters today, Lord. Remind them that you started a work that you want to finish in their lives. That we need to be committed to that, Lord. And we can rest when we get to heaven, God. But today... Today we run. Today we do what we're called to do, God. And we commit it into your hands because we want to finish well. We want to finish strong. We want to finish the work you've called us to. So thank you, Lord. We praise you this morning. We ask this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen.